Hello, greetings. Thank you uh, for joining us for this very important uh, discussion. Uh, my name is Nadia McConnell. I'm president of the US Ukraine Foundation. However, before we get to this topic, I want to take uh, a minute to uh, commemorate the 32nd anniversary of the Chernobyl uh, accident. Yesterday, April the 26th, was the um, accident that took place in Chernobyl. The Kremlin response from April the 26th to May the 14th, which is when uh, Gorbachev first made an acknowledgement of what took place. The Kremlin response was to tell no one. Even when uh, asked by first the Swedish um, scientists that they said that there was radi they detected uh, radiation. However, on May 1, Despite requests from Shcherbitsky of uh, to cancel the, the May Day parade, uh, Gorbachev insisted that they go ahead. So May 1 was the traditional May Day parade and the children of Ukraine, of all ethnic backgrounds, marched down the main street carrying flowers while radiation was pouring on their heads. And then incredibly on May, I think it was, the sixth to the ninth, there was even a bicycle race. So what we see then and now that the Kremlin has total disregard of human life, including the most innocent and vulnerable, the children of Ukraine. So today we are discussing another horrific period of the dangers for the children of Ukraine. According to statistics, official records, nearly uh, 20,000 children have been kidnapped and held in camps throughout Russia. We are honored today to have with us our three honorary co-sponsors for this working round table. These are members of Congress who have been steadfast warriors and supporters of Ukraine, but also have focused a lot of their work on this particular issue of children that are being held captive by Putin and his regime. First, we have with us Congresswoman Susan Wild from the seventh district of Pennsylvania, who has been very, very uh, vocal and active. And I hear all the time from your constituents, Marta Fedorio, of your ongoing work. Of course, you introduced a resolution uh, last session, and then you have reintroduced it today. And I also heard your appearance in last week's Foreign Affairs uh, Committee hearing, where you had the Prosecutor General testifying uh, about these war crimes. Congresswoman Susan Weil, thank you so very much for being with us, and I turn over the floor to you. Thank you very much. Um, and I just wanna say how honored I am to be with all of you today. Um, it, it, I am, have the distinct honor of representing one of the largest um, uh, communities of Ukrainian Americans in the United States and in Pennsylvania. And I've grown to know them well, even long before this horrible war started. And it's just my honor to serve as their representative and make sure that we are doing everything that we can in the United States to help the country of Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Um, all of you who take part in these conversations bring such critical perspectives and a wealth of knowledge that I deeply admire. I'm learning every day and I'm deeply grateful to all of you. And I will say it is thanks to all of you and your continued efforts on behalf of Ukraine that the movement supporting our Ukrainian neighbors is strong and enduring. And it's a movement that I am incredibly proud to be part of. Um, 
I've had the incredible opportunity of getting to know many of my Ukrainian constituents very well, including Marta Fedori, who is here with us today from Lehigh County, and I believe is the individual who's responsible for having me um, speak today. Marta, thank you for your friendship, first of all, but also for all of your work bringing awareness to the continued importance of standing with Ukraine, and particularly with the Ukrainian children who have been victim to atrocious war crimes, a critical part in the efforts to bring the Russian perpetrators to justice. Since the very early days of the war, I have been proud to stand alongside advocates like Marta, like Father Richard Gendrus of the St. Mary's Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Allentown, with whom I communicate on a very regular basis. Um, and alongside all of those who are experiencing Russia's brutal aggression firsthand, um, I had the um, honor of being among a small group, a small bipartisan group of members of Congress who traveled to the border of Ukraine in Poland um, in the second week of the war. And I will tell you that I will never, ever forget the sight of hundreds of thousands of people streaming across the Polish-Ukrainian border for safety and refuge, particularly women, their children, some elderly people, and just a few men who for one reason or another were not able to stay and fight. And I will never forget the look on the mother's faces. I'm a mother myself. I have two children who are now grown, but the mother's faces looked so tense, worried, stressed, at the same time trying to care for their children. The children who are children um, were for the most part in very good spirits, well-wishers at the border, had small token items for them, candy, little mini trucks, that kind of thing. And, and they all looked happy and were, were happy to see us. But I remember the mostly the look of the mothers and their deep, deep concern um, because I could feel it um, as a mother myself. And I'll never forget the, the stories that I have heard about the atrocities that were committed by and have are continue to be committed by Vladimir Putin and against civilians and against children. As you've heard, I'm a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And just last week, we heard the testimony of Ukrainian Prosecutor General Kostin on the nearly 80,000 cases of war crimes registered since February 2022. We heard stories about as many as 20,000 children, and we are quite certain the number is significantly higher. Those are just the documented ones of children forcibly abducted from their parents' arms. We heard from a survivor of those war crimes about the horrors committed against her. And um, we also heard from uh, the attorney of a 12-year-old boy who was present in Washington in the Capitol, but was kept concealed in a side room for his own safety and protection. Um, and the testimony that we heard, there was, I, I have to say, there were not many dry eyes in the house. And that was, I will tell you, across party lines. Um, it, it, it's been heartbreaking and it was certainly heartbreaking to listen to. And I really admired Prosecutor General Costin in his steadfast um, presentation and response to questions um, that were so important for all of us on that committee to hear. But, you know, no words will ever fully describe the suffering that Ukrainians have faced at the hands of Russian aggression. And I, among many others here in Congress, are deeply committed to doing everything that I can do um, from pushing the United States to do more um, to supporting Ukraine, to stand up for democracy and human rights, and to supporting Ukraine and its rebuilding efforts when this horrible war is finally over. Because we know that a threat to democracy anywhere is a threat to democracy everywhere. Um, our commitment takes shape through much of our work on the Foreign Affairs Committee, um, from urging President Biden to allow Ukrainian orphans and their caretakers to gain temporary stay in the United States, to condemning the massacre in Bucha, to standing with both Republicans and Democrats and urging President Biden to equip Ukraine with F-16 fighter jets, to leading a bipartisan group of my colleagues in condemning Russia's abduction of Ukrainian children. 
I am very proud that this resolution was read earlier this year at the United Nations presentation or their panel discussion on gross human rights violations due to the aggression against Ukraine, um, specifically the discussion on violations of the right of the child, which I believe shone light on the egregious war crimes that are being committed against children. Please know that my commitment to continuing to stand with you and to stand up for democracy in Ukraine is unwavering. It is not dependent on public opinion here in the United States. Although right now I will tell you, we still are seeing a vast amount of favorable public opinion for US support. It is not dependent on politics here in the United States. This is something that I am committed to and I will stand with you and I will remain um, this way as long as this war is going on. I am. I was. I also had the very good fortune of being present in the House chamber when President Zelensky appeared before us last year, um, and he, when he addressed our colleagues, I'll never forget him saying, "We stand, we fight, and we will win because we are united: Ukraine, America, and the entire free world." He was right then, and he's right now. And with that, I'm going to wish all of you a very welcome ahead of today's important conversations. So honored to be a small part of these efforts to rescue survivors and welcome refugees into our communities and bring the perpetrators of evil to justice. And I will be by your side until freedom and justice are won and the children are brought home. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congressman Wild, uh, for your support, your encouragement, and your, certainly your deep engagement with us. And thank you for reminding us for really uh, the trauma that is being suffered by all the children of Ukraine in different ways. Though dis today's topic, of course, is the, the ones that are being kidnapped, but you have very uh, succinctly brought us uh, to understand the whole broader picture of the trauma that is being suffered by the children. And of course, you mentioned the, the mothers who really are uh, on their own having to take care of these children while the fathers are off uh, fighting. So Congressman, well, again, thank you so much for being with us. And we really uh, look to continuing working with you to move this issue forward. So again, thank you so much. So thank you. And now uh, we will hear uh, a message from uh, Senator Klobuchar, who also is one of the steadfast warriors um, on this issue. Senator Klobuchar. Hello, and thank you to everyone attending today's important event hosted by the U.S.-Ukraine Foundation, Rescuing Children and Women Imprisoned by Putin. I want to recognize the work of the U.S.-Ukraine Foundation and the organizations co-hosting this event in elevating this crucial issue. Thank you for your steadfast advocacy on behalf of the people of Ukraine and for spotlighting Russia's horrific war crimes, including the deliberate and systemic targeting of women and children. For those of us who have been following Russians' pattern of aggression toward Ukraine, and I know this group has, the unprovoked invasion didn't come as a complete surprise. But what is shocking to many, and maybe not to you, is the unrelenting, inhuman barbarism of Vladimir Putin. The bombing of maternity wards, the demolition of apartment buildings, the mass grave. I saw the sights of those atrocities in Bucha and Irpin when former Senator Rob Portman and I went to Ukraine just last August to meet with President Zelensky. Those images will stick with me for the rest of my life. As we know, some of the most defenseless victims caught in the middle of this war are Ukrainian kids. We know that Russia has kidnapped and removed at least 6,000 innocent children from their homes and communities in Ukraine, and likely tens of thousands more, stripping them of their connection to their families, their sense of culture, and the beautiful sunflowers of their homeland. Instead, they've been forced into the homes of Russian strangers or detention camps under God knows what conditions, where they're subject to abuse and exploitation. It's a sick attempt at brainwashing, and it must not be tolerated. As a former prosecutor, I know what it feels like when you have a little kid who is a victim and you learn their story and you look at the case and you realize you may be the only one left to speak up for this child. That's how I feel about these abducted Ukrainian kids. 
That's why I'm leading a bipartisan resolution in the U.S. Senate calling out Vladimir Putin's and Russians' barbaric treatment of these children. The Kremlin needs to know that the world is watching and that we're going to continue to hold Russia accountable and stand with the people of Ukraine as we shed a light on the horrors of this crisis. As the Ukrainian people continue to defend themselves against Russian aggression, we will continue to stand with Ukraine. I think we can all agree on the importance of defending and safeguarding the Ukrainian kids who have been caught up in the turmoil. The abduction of innocent children from their families, it's a horrible crime. The parents and relatives of these kids are going through hell. We must do everything in our power, working with partners in Ukraine and globally, to ensure the safe return of these Ukrainian children to their families as quickly as possible. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar, again, for your uh, words of inspiration and the determination you are showing to um, fight this evil crime. And we really appreciate it and look forward to working together with you on this. Last, but of course not least, is Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, who is the longest serving member of Congress, um, woman uh, in history, and who uh, from the very first days of her being in Congress has been a, a member of the Ukraine caucus and co currently co-chairs it. Um, Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, please. Good morning. My name is Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, and I'm the Congresswoman for Ohio's 9th Congressional District that encompasses much of northwestern Ohio along Lake Erie. Thank you to the U.S. Ukraine Foundation for hosting this important roundtable to draw to light the abduction of Ukrainian women and children by Vladimir Putin's criminal regime. As a unified voice for the partnership between the American and Ukrainian people, your work is essential to ensuring Ukraine is successful in its great struggle to regain its liberty. Ukraine seeks to live in peace, but in an attempt to wield his power, Vladimir Putin plunged Ukraine into a dark war of aggression that Ukraine did nothing to provoke. When Ukraine fought back to hold its own land, Putin unleashed a calculated and deliberate cultural genocide against the Ukrainian people. Putin bombed civilians, kidnapped children, raped Ukrainian women, and murdered the elderly. These heinous crimes seek to rob Ukraine of its identity and future. The free world cannot let this happen. Ukraine must persevere in its struggle to win back its liberty. The global community must use every tool at its disposal to call out the Putin regime for the crimes being committed against humanity. The arrest warrants issued by the International Criminal Court are an important step toward holding Putin accountable. However, much more must be done, and that is why I'm calling for the creation of a special tribunal to prosecute Russian leaders for their war of aggression on the innocent. War criminals must be brought to justice so that liberty may prevail for Ukraine and her people. As an original founder and co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Ukraine Caucus, I can assure you that you have our caucus's full support. Our caucus stands with you and Ukraine. We are committed to work with you to ensure Ukrainian families, which have been torn apart by this brutal and awful war, can be made whole again, and that Putin is brought to justice for his bestial war crimes. Thank you again for your invitation to speak today. Slava Ukraini and Dyakuyu. Thank you so much, uh, Congressman uh, Marcy Kaptur. With the kind of leadership we're seeing from the U.S. Congress, and I think also what we're seeing um, emerging in other parts of the world, and certainly, of course, uh, with the leadership that's coming from Ukraine itself, we are honored today to have with us um, Victoria Litvinova, who is the Deputy uh, Prosecutor General of Ukraine responsible for this, uh, for this issue. And we welcome you again. We were privileged to welcome you, I think, only days after your appointment. Um, and so we um, look forward to your remarks and perhaps you can update uh, us on um, what you are, uh, where you are today and where do you um, hope to go in the future. Thank you so much, Victoria. Uh, 
the uh, participants uh, we want to uh, express special thanks to Mrs. Captain, Mr. Chow, Mrs. Uh, uh, Captain. So I would like to mention that uh, it's absolutely incredible support from the side of the United States. And uh, last week, the general prosecutor um, uh, had the white visit to the United States. So, well, and um, the topic on the responsibility for the deportation, uh, um, that's one of the main uh, uh, direction of our activities in our working meetings. So, very important uh, the position of Ukraine, and this position uh, uh, of Ukraine gets the very special support of the United States. Also, I would like to mention the resolution and so. Uh, this is Shard also uh, from the Democratic Party. Uh, confirms the resolution, and the resolution uh, shows that this is the uh, vulnerable uh, crime against the humanity. This is what happened to the Ukrainian kids in this crime. So, and uh, this uh, crimes were done uh, in the past by the cruel uh, regimes, totalitaristic uh, regimes. And that's the resolution called the International Organization to work uh, uh, in regards with the return of Ukrainian kids to Ukraine as soon as possible. In February of this uh, year, the world got a lot of uh, investigations regarding the uh, uh, so-called forced adaptation and uh, uh, the deportation of Ukraine. Also, well, uh, uh, it was the investigation from the Yale's uh, uh, University. So it was uh, also mentioned about the detection uh, camps uh, and the forced adaptation which happened, and also there are different goals uh, of, of this, uh, you know, uh, activity. So the main goals, uh, uh, that's uh, to push the people and the kids to become pro-Russians and so on. And uh, it should be also the investigation regarding the uh, forced adaptation. This is the main priority of the Office of the General uh, Prosecutor of Ukraine. So well, this crime is the massive crime and system Systematic crime, so we absolutely sure that this is not only the crime, but it's a kind of a, a focus policy to uh, destroy Ukraine, and that's uh, the uh, intention to push uh, the kids to lose the Ukrainian identity, and uh, so uh, it's a genocide. So let's you can uh, get this uh, in the convention even. So and parallelly, we are also making the consolidating activities together with the other uh, world organizations just to investigate uh, other international crimes uh, done from the side of. Uh, you, uh, Russia against Ukraine, so we have to set up the responsibility and uh, we have to use the International Criminal Court uh, also in this activity. So the International Court uh, also plays a very important role in this uh, activity. So uh, we have to understand that uh, uh, that's the main contents of this and uh, we have to bring the perpetrators to justice. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Karim Han, the International uh, uh, Prosecutor's Office, uh, and the General Prosecutor's, uh, we are uh, working together. So, we support the International Criminal Court Courts to gather the uh, uh, different information. And uh, also, for us, the very important results of this cooperation. This this is the getting orders to uh, arrest Putin and others. And also, we have to provide the investigation on the national level with the implementing the all important information. So all the uh, prosecutors' uh, bodies also they are coordinating the involvement of the non-government organization and other institutions of the. Uh, uh, non-governmental uh, activity on the national level. So, and no doubt, uh, our work with the kids uh, demands a very special approach. Uh, and especially in that case, uh, well, we have uh, the uh, witnesses and uh, those who just suffered from the uh, war crime. So we have to avoid the... Uh, 
dramatization uh, and we have to get yeah, the um, uh, activity from the side of the uh, witnesses. So we also need to involve those psychologists and witnesses, uh, those uh, uh, to uh, interview them, to coordinate them, to provide the psychological and social support for them, especially for those uh, uh, who suffered uh, from these criminals uh, war crimes. Uh, and I also would like to say that our uh, persecution uh, regarding the deportation of Ukrainian kids, we have to understand that we have the main three tasks. So return of Ukrainian kids back, then providing the responsibility those who are in charge of this, and then protection of the rights of the witnesses and those uh, who got, uh, who was uh, violated. Victoria, thank you so much for that comprehensive um, summary of, of where things stand today. And um, I happened to listen to um, the prosecutor general, um, Kostin, who I think it was over three hours, three and a half hours where he testified uh, before the committee. And there was a lot of discussion about the kind of assistance that we can provide you and, of course, uh, people of Ukraine. And we will be following up on that and working with our Congress to see that that becomes a reality. So thank you again very much. I want to, uh, I think it was Senator Klobuchar or, um, who mentioned about the various participating organization. And I do wanna thank all of the organizations that have come on board to help put together this uh, very important discussion, this round table which is to result really in uh, some uh, short-term goals, uh, one of which will be hopefully to create a global coalition of organizations and activists who can focus on this issue, but also to identify an action plan for each of the various poli policy centers, be it the United States, be it the UN, the EU, or of course, what can be done in Ukraine. In this area, as in much of what has taken place in Ukraine since the war began in 2014, um, the first responders really have been uh, from civil society. And so our very first panel will really cover the leadership role that has been played by various activists and organizations in addressing these issues. And then they will also describe when they have been also working in partnership with government institutions. We are very grateful to have as a moderator with us, Jackie Alemani. She is a congressional investigations reporter for the Washington Post. She was also the a founder co-author of the early 202 Post flagship early morning newsletter uh, which featured, of course, the, the day's most critical news in the power centers, uh, including the White House, the Hill, and of course, various government agencies, the Pentagon. Alan Money is also an on-air contributor to NBC News and MSNBC. Uh, she's um, covered the White, for CBS, she was there for six years, where she covered the Trump White House. She's a graduate of Harvard, where she was also a coach of the women's basketball team. So we are very uh, grateful and honored to have uh, Jackie with us this morning to moderate this very important uh, panel discussion and perhaps share some of her um, reporting of what she's done about Ukraine. Jackie, over to you. Thank you so much, Nadia. Um, it's an honor to be in conversation with all of you. Uh, unlike some of my very courageous peers and colleagues. I have not been covering um, the war on the front lines in Ukraine, but highly recommend um, reading uh, the work of, of the Washington Post, the New York Times, and so many others, especially a lot of the local outlets actually um, reporting on the ground in Ukraine, whose work has been indispensable to seeing the, the horrors that are being inflicted on Ukrainians by uh, the Russians. Um, I've been covering this more from a domestic angle, seeing sort of the battle going on on Capitol Hill, 
um, in terms of the sort of tensions on how much and how how much longer to continue to support the efforts in in Ukraine to fight against the Russians and um, so far uh, that that is a battle that it seems um, the Ukrainians are winning. Obviously, we all saw President Zelensky show up to make that pitch himself earlier this year. Um, but I do want to quickly get to my uh, outstanding and, and very brave and accomplished guests who are joining us today. Um, we have Alexandre, and I apologize in advance for any names that I, I butcher. I do have a Ukrainian roommate who was actually a hockey star whose uh, family is still in Ukraine, although her sister managed to cross the border to Poland and actually, with the help of, of Senator Markey and some other lawmakers, um, made it to Boston to stay with her along with her baby and her dog. Um, but I'll try not to butcher these names too much. Um, we have with us Oleksandra Romanetsova, who is the executive director of the Center for Civil Liberties, um, which is uh, the establishment of human rights, democracy, and solidarity in Ukraine. It's one of the leading actors that is influencing the formation of public opinion and public policy and the promotion of human rights. We have Mykola Kuleba, the CEO of Save Ukraine and the former ombudsman for children with the president of Ukraine uh, position um, that she served in from 2014 to 2021. Uh, sorry, that he served in. Um, but now he is the, uh, again, the director of the NGO Save Ukraine, which is providing assistance to vulnerable populations in the war zone in Ukraine. We also have Dina uh, Yurike, who is the um, head of helping to leave NGO. She is actually heading the evacuation from the occupied and liberated territories unit of that NGO, um, helping people uh, evacuate areas of military conflict. We have Yulia Kamerik, who is a journalist at uh, Slitisinfo uh, Television, I believe, or Slitisinfo.info. Um, again, a Ukrainian journalist uh, who focused on high-scale crimes, political corruption, and war crimes. Um, and then we have uh, Danielle Daura, who is um, working at Find My Parent, a tech organization that was founded by parents of abducted children. She works to help find some of these abducted children and empower some of the most vulnerable children and refugees across the world, not just Ukraine, but Syria as well. Um, and then lastly, we have Lieutenant Colonel Vasily Bodan, who is the head of the Juvenile uh, Protection Department uh, at the National Police of Ukraine. Thank you all so much for, for joining us. I know um, you are all extremely busy, so we really appreciate your time. I want to start with the issue that I think has really gripped the attention of Americans in particular. Um, and there's been some some uh, very horrifying but important coverage of this issue, which is the abduction of, of children, people, children who have been deported to Russia, kidnapped. Um, right now, according to the Ukrainian government, the, the numbers are pretty staggering. Over 16,000 children have been deported to Russia. Some of them um, have been located, but a very limited amount have actually been returned. Many of these children have to go to what are being called filtration camps. They're being indoctrinated and prepared for adoption. Um, it is, is uh, again, a very troubling situation going on. So, um, Mykola, I wanted to start with you, since I feel like you really encountered this issue up front. Can you describe the scope of the issue and explain why Russians are doing this? While we're waiting for Mikola to, to get back on, um, I want to go to, to Danielle, who I'm hoping, you know, as someone who is actually intimately involved with trying to find some of these children, can explain what those efforts look like and also speak to the, the breadth of the challenge. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. So first of all, I would just really like to thank you all for the opportunity to come today and speak about the work uh, Find My Parent is doing in Ukraine in partnership with the National Police of Ukraine. Um, so as already mentioned, a lot of people who are, who've been separated from Ukraine, and, uh, as they're fleeing to Europe, their children have been injured, uh, potentially killed during the conflict. And of course, we have a large number of children who've been forcibly deported, even though they may still have family or relatives in Ukraine. And we know that these children are highly vulnerable to human trafficking. And we know that research shows that when children do not grow up in the presence of both of their parents, they suffer socially, economically, school, health outcomes. So they're more likely to grow up in poverty, have behavior issues depression, unfortunately suicide, they don't do as good at school, and they have poor health outcomes. And so that's why family parents work very closely with the National Police of Ukraine to empower these families to reunite as quickly as possible um, and really to protect Ukrainian children because they are so vulnerable right now. So Find My Parents first started our work back in 2020 uh, two of my co-founders are fathers of abducted children. Both um, of them had their children abducted by their former spouses. And so we really built our technology, which is available through a mobile app, to empower their own children to find them. In fact, one of my co-founders, Vincent Fichot, who's a French national, his two children continue to be abducted to Japan, and he has no word about their well-being or anything and has not in the last four years. So when the war broke out in Ukraine, we saw all these images of children leaving the country unoccupied, and we knew that our technology could be really powerful to prevent harm to these children and reunite them with their families. And so we partnered with the National Police of Ukraine, and we replicated our mobile application to the Ukrainian market. So today, anyone can go either to the Apple Store or the Google Play Store if they have an Android device, and they they can mobile app open up Ukraine for free. When they do the app, right now it's available in Ukrainian and we're working on uh, getting it out in Russian and English and languages continuously. When they download the app, the user creates a profile. And in that profile, they can add as much information and themselves, their family, etc. When two users are using the have created profiles, our artificial intelligence at ignition, image duplication, and the data to match the two individuals. And that even works if one person, let's say a young child, knows nothing about their, their parent, for example. Built this technology specifically for children, but in reality, it can be used by any person who's become separated from a family member. In this case, is playing an active role leading on verifying identities and especially verifying any matches of children so we can protect family and uh, social access to social services pre and post reunification. So really today, Reunite Ukraine, our mobile app, exemplifies the impact that we can have when we use technology to solve social problems. As more public and nonprofit actors utilize Find My Parents technology, it's more sure that we can reunite. So just imagine, a police officer in Bucharest comes across a ch child banging on the street, maybe a victim to human trafficking. That police officer could use our mobile application to match that child back to his or her, her parents or relatives in Ukraine. A humanitarian worker working for like the International Office of Migration or the United Nations, who's tasked with registering unaccompanied minors as they cross international borders, and again, use our technology to match children to their families. These children have been forced adopted by foreign families. They can use our Ukrainian roots to find relatives at home and start the process of reunification of Ukraine. Child at a hospital, find that child belongs to. And again, all matches are verified by the National Police of Ukraine to protect children. And finally, families inside or outside, because it is a preventive tool. The reality is we have no idea who in our personal networks has been affected by separation, and we know who will be separated. Everybody is at risk here, so it can be used as a preventive tool. 
So I just kind of want to wrap up by saying, ensuring that our tech possible, which is reunification of children, is to spread awareness about our technology. Anybody can download it for free. So I really encourage anybody to share it within their personal and professional network. It's key to link it to law enforcement, especially across Europe. And it's also to integrate our technology with the international humanitarian system, including organizations like IOM, UNHCR, and the Red Cross. Thank you. And I, I do want to get back to that topic um, in a little bit about, you know, how to facilitate the the best kind of reunification, because obviously these children have been through extreme trauma. But um, I also think it's important to have a, a little bit more context about what exactly these children are facing. I know it's um, hard to hear, but I think it's important to hear in a time of war um, what is some of the, the gory details of what these children are up against. So Yulia, I'm, you know, you've done a lot of work investigating corruption and criminal offenses, including crimes against children. Can, can you share some of that reporting and what you have seen, um, perpetrated against Ukrainian children? Yes, uh, we make uh, very many uh, investigations about war crimes in front lines in uh, the occupied uh, territories. Uh, and uh, our last uh, work, it was a film about two girls who was kidnapped from Kherson uh, and taken to the Crimea. Uh, we found this girl, uh, we found evidence how uh, Russians uh, kidnapped uh, more than uh, 50,000 uh, kids from Kherson. And uh, we found uh, people who help with um, make, make with crimes. This is, was teachers from Kherson and it was shocked for us because teacher um, is close to the kid and he can he can tell everything and it's a problem because uh, kids cannot decide for themselves themselves uh, they can stand up for themselves and uh, russians can't easy to trick them and can easy to take them and make everything what he want so uh, I hope uh, our prosecutors will check our evidence and make official investigation about these war crimes. And also for us, um, it's very important uh, what we have attention from uh, international community because with, uh, without you, we cannot decide this problem. And Yulia, I'm wondering, is there any way to support your journalistic endeavors that would maybe at the end of the program um, you can share in the chat with everyone um, a way to either donate or uh, or, or spread your work? Um, but thank you for, for that inc incredibly important and I know at times very dangerous work. Um, Dina, I want to um, sort of talk about the other uh side of the coin here which is the children who are lucky enough to be evacuated you help with those efforts as um, the head of the evacuation from um, occupied and liberated territories can you talk a little bit about what this looks like in ukraine and maybe um share any stories in particular of some success stories some victories that you've had for a little good news for us um, yeah, of course. Thank you um, for inviting me here. And um, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, bringing attention to this extremely important topic of citizens of Ukraine and especially the Ukrainian kids being deported to the territory of the aggressor country, Russia. So we are helping to leave. We have been facing this problem for quite some time because throughout the whole last year, we were organizing those large scale operations for evacuating people from temporarily occupied territories to Ukraine controlled site and people who were forcibly deported to the territory of Russian Federation 
um, what we do, we help them get back to Ukraine or to safe European countries. So we started doing this from the first day of the full scale invasion, 24th February 2022. And since then, we helped over 17,000 people escape temporarily occupied territories and over 2,500 more that were already deported to leave Russia. So for that part of our work, we operate through a Telegram bot where we are directly contacted either by people requesting evacuation for themselves or by their relatives from Ukraine-controlled territories. And throughout those conversations with people asking for help, the topics of separated families and kids being taken away from their parents would arise, you know, quite naturally in a very horrifying manner. So I would like to bring your attention to the fact that separating parents from kids is a typical policy of the Russian Federation within the occupied territories. It is done intentionally and it is done in a systematical way and it is done widely throughout the whole scope of those territories. Parents are being threatened that their kids would be taken away in order to terrify them and to make them obey the occupational authorities. So we know about cases in Kherson, for instance, when parents were taken to the basement to be tortured and the teenage kids were left alone and were hiding, they were hiding around the village uh, and not to be deported, they were asking for our help through our Telegram bot. We know that before the start of the academic year, 2022, a lot of parents in the occupied territories did not want to send their kids to schools because of the propaganda they would hear there, and they chose to homeschool them. And then they were being threatened by the occupational authorities that their kids would be just taken away if they don't go to school. We have screenshots of the messages with threats that were sent to those parents. We know uh, instances when kids were taken away from their parents for medical reasons and then transported to Russia alone without guardians, without telling their parents which hospital the kids were in, kids being told that the mom is dead and they're going to go to a foster family, while mom at the same time was actively and desperately trying to locate the hospital to reunite with their kid. So... That being said, and again, I would like to emphasize that this is a systematic policy. Deportations, including kids' deportations, being a strategy played by the Russian Federation against the Ukrainian people. Let's think about those cases that we receive. They are those when there is someone that can contact us, be it a Ukrainian teenager trying to escape adoption to a Russian family and return to Ukraine, or a mother looking for her daughter taken to a hospital in Russia and never brought back. But there are so many more when kids are taken away, they are not teenagers yet, and they could be six or seven years old or even as little as four months. We know of an orphanage house in Kherson that had four dozens of kids aged from four months to four years taken to occupied Crimea and then probably further to Russian Federation. Those kids cannot speak for themselves yet. And with the intensive propaganda in the so-called re-education schedule, in a year from now, due to trauma defense mechanisms after the victory of Ukraine, which we hope all will come as soon as possible, Possible, they might not even recall their former whereabouts. And that is why it is super crucial now not just to work on returning those instances, those cases of kids that we know of and what we are already doing. It is very important to trace the deportation routes and locate institutions inside Russia where the deported are being held either temporarily or permanently. In the long scale perspectives that work on identifying known orphanages, camps, psychological institutions, etc., that are being used to accommodate Ukrainian kids deported without guardians will allow us to bring as much of them back as possible. A good start of that and a good example is a report published recently by Yale University and we urge those international organizations and individuals that want to help try and identify and work on this network of locations. We are doing it now constantly from our side, just like through open sources and social media and reports from our cases, but there's so much more to be done. And another thing I would like to say that kind of arises from my previous point is the issue of publicity. We are strongly convinced that although the overall issue of deportations should be widely covered, of course, and international attention should definitely be brought to those horrific events, individual details of individual cases and especially locations where the kids are taken from, where they are accommodated in Russia, should better stay covered. We, we from our side at Helping to Live, we try not to bring attention to details of individual stories as this could come 
this could harm future operations to take the kids out from Russia. Because the aggressor authorities do monitor international media and react to them. One good example is the story of a group of teenagers that were deported under personal supervision of Maria Lvova Belova, and one of them she personally adopted. And after successful evacuation of one of the teenagers from that group, whom we helped to escape and return to Ukraine to the guardianship of his sister, media attention was brought to this story. And this led to changes in control and monitoring of movements for all deported Ukrainian kids of teenage age. So it is very important to find the right balance between covering the overall scale of events related to deportation of children, but not to give out the unnecessary details as it can and actually is harming evacuation operations for other kids that still remain inside the aggressor country and that still need our help. So we have to keep in mind that the aggressor keeps committing the war crimes and keeps adapting to the changing environment, despite the world's effort to stop it. So to sum up, we are helping to leave or working with deported kids to help them get back to Ukraine at a case-by-case -case basis. We work in close cooperation with the Ministry of Reintegration of Temporarily Occupied Territories of Ukraine. We truly appreciate all NGOs involved in this hard work and believe that all together, with mutual support, we can do as much as possible in this awful situation. And also, I would like to say again that we cannot separate deportation from occupation itself. This issue is one and the same, and if we really want to take, want to tackle the deportations, we have to let Ukraine liberate its territories. Thank you again. Slava Ukraini. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, you know, that's really interesting about the details that should be made public and what is better off being left private. And I'm wondering, um, Lieutenant Colonel Bowden, if you, you heading up, obviously, the prevention of some of this crime and these abductions, I'm wondering if you can um, share your thoughts on the endeavor uh, that you are leading um, to prevent some of these crimes, what you're seeing firsthand, and um, the the risk of retribution that comes with sometimes the over-publicity of certain information. Inconveniences because of the voice cancellations. So I am the chief of the UNL Prevention Department of the National Police of Ukraine. So thank you so much for inviting me and for this opportunity to take part uh, into this important uh, event. So well, the war, uh, which started from the side of the aggression country, so we also influenced a lot uh, from the very small uh, person to the older people so well. Uh, a lot of people change the year of professionals. Uh, so the, you know, adults, uh, they join the army to protect the country. So what the uh, uh, teenagers and kids, they are not responsible for the decision. So well, what uh, for this uh, police uh, 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 side, we have to protect the vulnerable people. So especially we have to protect from the sexual uh, in, uh, uh, vulnerability. So we have to uh, protect them from deportation, from other things. So it's kind of, you know, a lot of uh, bad things we've done from the side of the Russian invaders. And so unfortunately, there is a high uh, range of uh, uh, war crimes which were uh, done from the side of the Russian So we have a lot of... Uh, 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 kids uh, who were killed, so 771 were wounded. Uh, so, uh, so also recently we got two uh, eight-year-old uh, uh, girls wounded. So, well, uh, in some territories of Ukraine, we have the uh, uh, action. So, well, partly the territory of Ukraine are occupied. So, but nevertheless, we're just doing a lot to protect the people. So, well, we just, but despite of the fact. Uh, we found that 2,000 Ukrainian kids were deported to Russian Federation territory, but 
actually in reality it's even more. So, well, well, we shouldn't forget when we're talking about the figures. So, well, it's not statistics. It's not advanced statistics. It's a kind of a, you know, that's a thousands of the destroyed uh, souls. And uh, so, well, the aggressors, they have uh, at least five scenarios they use for deportation. So, the first, uh, this is abduction. So, well, the abductions, uh, they just used uh, during this special uh, operation. So, some family uh, captured and then they just, you know, abducted the kids from them. So, well, they um, made it on the partly occupied uh, territories. So, well, uh, we do have some cases of those people who were uh, returned back. So, well, the second is then the abduction directly from the family. So, sometimes uh, they use the uh, specific uh, legal uh, uh, foundation and according with the legal foundation, they can uh, do this so well. And then, uh, then the third uh, is uh, first uh, the occupants, they could kill the families and then they can take the kids from this uh, area. So well, the fourth scenario is then uh, when they stop the evacuation, I mean, from the side of the Russian uh, uh, soldiers, they just, you know, uh, stop the evacuation. So it happened like in here, so, so well, they just, you know, um, um, also manipulated, uh, uh, they just took the uh, uh, sick people, sick kids uh, to the territory of Russia. So they're doing everything possible not to give the chance to Ukrainians uh, to get them back. So, and and the, and the fifth uh, is so-called uh, uh, tricky, uh, so-called abilities for getting the so-called rehabilitation period for the kids. So they are just trying to invite the, the kids uh, for the three weeks rehabilitation process. And after three weeks, uh, of course, the kids, they will never return back. So, well, and, uh, so well, we face this uh, two times, and then this is a kind of a poor she thought uh, uh, from the side of the occupants, uh, uh, they just trying to push the kids to think that the, the kids they don't need uh, the the family and the parents they don't need them anymore, etc. So, and that's a uh, crimes. And Victoria Litvin already mentioned really about this that the International Criminal Court uh, should uh, uh, investigate all these uh, cases uh, and uh, also. Uh, we, as the police representatives, uh, also dealing with the uh, different uh, uh, special documentary uh, activities. So well, we gathered the documents and information about this uh, kids. Also, we just uh, established the specific mobile groups, the UNL policemen. That means the group of the UNL policemen working together. So it's kind of a mobile operative uh, groups to be worked on this territory. And also. We are working with the uh, uh, different upgraded uh, uh, work of the uh, police departments so well. uh, and uh, the um, activity of the policemen focused on the prevention measures and uh, following the first uh, uh, aid uh, needs uh, for the kids. Uh, so evacuation of the kids, uh, uh, provision of the uh, uh, following the uh, uh, rights of the kids, uh, pre preventing measures, provision for them, humanitarian mission, uh, demining, etc. Also, the department of our police uh, also supports the evacuated kids uh, and also um, helps a lot uh, during the evacuation process. So, well, and especially very important to pay attention to those handicapped uh, or uh, disabled kids uh, and uh, to uh, uh, provide the uh, comfort conditions uh, for living uh, for them also to provide the maximum safety level for the kids to prevent them from uh, being uh, abused to uh, also uh, we uh, 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 passed 500 special uh, personal uh, measures of safety and we also provided the automobiles for evacuation and also because 
terms of our work and the military administration. We've done a lot of evacuation processes and uh, we've done a lot of 130, 100,000 uh, uh, kids. And uh, for this, uh, 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 we have the special teams of police, we call it the White Angels uh, departments, groups, and they are working on the uh, special area where the military actions are in uh, process. So also, we're just uh, uh, um, working with those uh, uh, who are lost, uh, those who are missed, uh, and uh, as for today, we got 12,000 apply for the kids who were missed, and so we started to deal with them so well, and uh, yeah, we have uh, 400 uh, uh, kids uh, uh, whose uh, 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 localization is unknown for us. And, uh, so we have the main tasks, and the main asks also, uh, among the main asks, tasks is the uh, simplifying the procedure of the uh, information to be applied for the further investigations and uh, and uh, uh, we're also dealing with the crime against kids and, uh, we are working with the facts of deportation or the changing of the citizenships and also we have the information platform which has the name ddv need the kids of war and uh, this platform is quite uh, active and uh, so we uh, also uh, providing the very special system of the so-called uh, 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 information gathering. So, well, that's a kind of a specialized uh, service uh, with the so-called fast uh, reaction on the uh, um, uh, facts of uh, uh, deportation. Uh, or abduction. So we also work with the American uh, uh, company, Find My Parents, and then uh, we have the very uh, fruitful cooperation. And also we just uh, started uh, to deal with the app, uh, and which is the uh, very efficient instrument uh, to uh, search the kids and also uh, to find those people who had to uh, uh, leave uh, Ukraine or those who were uh, forced to uh, uh, abducted uh, or uh, adopted. Uh, so well, because of this uh, uh, application, so we got a lot of uh, uh, information about the kids uh, from the uh, occupied territories. So well, we're just uh, dealing with this popularization and promotion with this uh, uh, application because it's very successful uh, to help to the kids uh, to unite with the families and to come to return to the families, etc. So, and and uh, it's a very important uh, tool for the communication. So, so, so policemen. Uh, they are uh, providing the humanitarian uh, uh, support together with volunteers, and uh, they are providing the support to those uh, uh, who are internally displaced people, those who are from the, the occupied territories, uh, those who are uh, living on the territory which are occupied, so we provided the elementary uh, routine things for them. So policemen uh, delivery, the uh, uh, food, uh, water, etc. Policemen also provided the help to the kids, uh, those who left the deoccupied territory. So we have uh, we have about three million uh, internally displaced kids. Uh, and uh, so it's a very important thing to provide the safety to them. And, and uh, uh, we are checking the conditions and the comfort level for them also. And uh, uh, we are dealing with the informational work. Uh, we raise the awareness among them. And we're just explaining uh, about the explosives uh, 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 features, etc. So information about the potential dangers, etc. So we want to express our thanks to uh, are you and we want to express uh, special thanks uh, for your support and the support of the Ukrainian people. Glory to Ukraine, Slavo Ukraine. Um, I selfishly was saving Sasha 
for the last um, question because I'm particularly interested in the work of influencing public opinion and policy as that is key to shoring up and maintaining support in the US in particular. Sasha, you also have won the Nobel Peace Prize. Can you talk about your work, how the prize has impacted your work and the challenges with uh, maintaining positive public opinion and this remarkable support that, that Ukraine has garnered from around the world? Thank you for the question. Uh, our work, my, my main work now is the Convention for Crime together with our partners from other human rights defender organizations, more than 30 of all the Ukraine. We call our initiative um, Tribunal for Putin because we think that exactly justice of such international crimes like uh, crimes against humanity, like the forcible deportation of children from occupied territory of Ukraine, and even now, liberated territory of Ukraine, but still uh, children can can be turned back because it's not the Russian Federation that give this opportunity. We think the justice was a little main role here. And I think ICC, uh, like international prosecutors, same, uh, have such opinion. That's why exactly warrant about uh, this crime Saturday at first and uh, exactly include uh, uh, include not only Maria Lvova Bilova, who exactly organized all of this process of uh, integrating Ukrainian children inside the Russian society, um, disconnect them with Ukrainian, the Ukrainian identity and include them in such exactly dangerous even for Russian children's, um, you know, um, cognitive health, uh, like uh, this supporting of patriotic uh, different action or military education or something like this, which we see in uh, Russian kindergartens and Russian schools. Uh, so just imagine that Ukrainian children who just now, after the war, after the um, civilian bomb bombarding uh, from Russia, rockets and all of this now need to be a part of all of this. It's all of this. It's a part of huge international crime. So crime of, uh, against humanity needs to be punished together like a systematic crime against uh, uh, crimes of aggression, which exactly include all the night year of, uh, of the war. So our main uh, work is the commented war crimes, systematize them, and our database now um, is 38,000 of such potential international crimes. And that means we bring all of this information to our international partners, ICC include them, an international investigation team, which working now the territory of Ukraine and uh, in general prosecutor office, sure. When we speak about cases of children, we have six, our personal cases, which uh, parents appear uh, exactly appeal to us. And uh, we uh, find these children together with some partners, human rights defenders and lawyers in the territory of Russia Federation. They still trying to help out there, uh, but they feel a really, really big, uh, huge pressure because uh, some of them even they trying to take back their license and don't give the opportunity to work. But still, is it it's possible uh, trying to find connection with uh, um, low rank uh, this administrative uh, person? <laughs> director of uh, such called summer camps, which be uh, with children, Ukrainian children sitting there, or for example, director of orphan house. And when you bring the documents, bring the relative there, they it's give opportunity, in, not in big scale, but in these small concrete cases, to back these children. And these children bring the information, which exactly Diana really really detail explain how how it's what kind of information these children give and they they exactly give the testimony uh, so we, we understood that uh, just in this way i uh, need to have a, like a frozen effect you know that just to stop this active process now uh, that's why it's so important to really cover show this process and i hope the icc exactly really quick manage this case and i hope this um goes uh, not only P uh, putin but maria Lvova below will feel the problems which connect with this warrant 
because till now she is react like I I don't can't understand why exactly uh, that that was uh, accused about of this. We just to save the children. It's not true. They uh, exactly broke the connections. These children not only with identity but withhold the list of their rights, like rights, their rights like citizens of Ukraine, their rights like children, because um, rights for security, have a family, have their own property, which exactly um, they, uh, they have here in the territory of Ukraine, if it happened. So all of this broken because uh, Russia Federation not only trying to take like physically these children, but they trying to broke all the information connections. So after, uh, after victory, it can be part of problem exactly. Not only find the children because if they adapt, uh, they like new parents can change their names, can change the even data of birth. So that's why it's so important now. Push down the Russian system exactly. Give us all the information about all the children. Which the one of message from Russia side that was three. 100,000 children we they ever created from territory of Ukraine. So exactly that's why when we speak about justice, we speak about, first of all, the first step, collect all of the data, push uh, put the pressure from international level to the <coughs> Russia side, which told about some um, uh, like peaceful negotiation, but peaceful negotiation possible only if you show your good, like, uh, your good motivation at all and started from children because it's it's now it's the biggest and painful crime uh, when we speak exactly about the life people of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I and I I think I don't know if you're just being um, very humble, but I would love for you to talk a little bit about the Nobel Peace Prize. And what that experience was like while while we have you. Okay, yeah, it gives us first of all opportunities because peace will, um, uh, like peace and freedom prize, uh, which exactly one of uh, kind of um, a Nobel Prize, give a, give opportunity to be louder, to put to light exactly what we are doing, and we first of all doing the documentary called the Night Years. It's not happened on the now. A uh, question with children uh, started being more painful from 2017 when um, occupied territory Donbass and Lugansk exactly stopped to give any information about orphan children. And you understood that uh, such conditions, which exactly society lives in, such called people republics, exactly bring a lot of new orphans' children because um, they're, they're not normal medicine. There are huge numerous of parents who was arrested or killed. So. Uh, so that started in 2017, and our work, uh, which uh, exactly uh, was awarded uh, by Nobel Prize, it's uh, it's not about uh, one year. It's about all the nine years of the war, and exactly talk, the topic of children still um, like it's it's not our main uh, to topic, but it's totally systematic part of all of this war crimes and all of aggression, which exactly Russia Federation brings to the territory of Ukraine from 2014. So Nobel Peace Prize give us attention, give us opportunity to speak with such region like uh, Global South. For example, I'm just I comes back from South Africa, where we speak about situation with the children. And you know that uh, Putin still inviting in the BRICS forum. So our main idea was the uh, horizontal co connections. We are not state representative, but we are human rights defenders. We are representative of civil society of Ukraine. And we just want to speak freely about the problems, which exactly South position of South Africa, which uh, they told about, no, but like, yeah, crimes, it maybe happened, but it's just a joke from ICC that it can be like, take like a seriously, nobody can accuse like president like Putin. What does it mean nobody? If you do like, if you do crimes, that means he need to be punished for that. So we are speaking about that. And our main idea was that exactly um, our position like Nobel Peace Prize Laureate give us opportunity to speak about that. And uh, uh, put the light in, in such really deep and horrible um, crimes which happen now. It's not happened somewhere last year, like like Bucha happened and that's all. No, every day small Bucha happened in the occupied territory. Every day Energa, Energadar nuclear power station, exactly, it's a huge 
potential, I don't know, explosion by radiation in the middle of Europe. And, and even this last um, news that exactly buses of this organization, Energodar uh, Nuclear Power Station was used to bring you a um, new group of children to Crimea arrest. So that means the potential it's they they will be really hard to come back, like come back from, from Ukraine when we will really release this one. So that's why our position, like another piece of advice we have, give us opportunity to develop them, give us a potential to put the life in these questions. And that's why we are happy to say Well, um, we don't have that much time left, but I wanted to let everyone know that Mikola had lost connection, um, the, that he's trying to reconnect, but it, it doesn't seem like that's doable. Um, but I I do have one question uh, for, for Dina before we have to, to log off about finding info about how difficult it is to track down children taken to Russia. And, and just how the NGO does that. Um, yeah, so so like I said, like our first uh, source are direct requests for help. And then uh, usually in that direct uh, request for help, we get a bit of information. And then if uh, a person is successfully evacuated and already when they are in, the, in safety, um they sometimes are willing to tell you more and they can tell about what they saw in in russia how things were going on and so on so that's one source of information another source of information is our like because we do evacuations from temporarily occupied territories as well uh like before the new year until mid of december there was a direct uh passage towards ukraine controlled territories in zaporizhia um, and we operate like with a secret discrete network of drivers that that we have in all like most of the occupied territories that can bring us news. Usually they come to a safe place and then they call us when they can to to tell things what like what is happening there. And from them, we can get the news, like, for instance, that there was a bus of kids that were sent to a summer camp, that there was a certain family that the kids were taken away from. Um, and also we are members at uh, the networks of telegram chats of the locals because usually the like people are discussing what is happening there, what is happening in their city. And sometimes the relatives are uh, sending this information to those telegram chats to kind of uh, gather the information together. So usually the People in the occupation, they find network signal and then they can call their relatives and say like, hey, I'm alive. This is what happened. There was like a shelling at this area. Somebody was killed, but I'm good and so on. And the relatives can get that bit of information. And then in the chat of the locals, they can share with other relatives. And if you monitor those chats constantly, you can get a big picture. So we have a research department that is doing um, that kind of work. So we are, we're collecting data from open sources. Another thing is the propaganda telegram channels and like social media and so on, because sometimes they are boasting um, like that we took away those children, you know, for health reasons, to summer camps for them to rest and so on. And you can get speed of information from there and then try to verify them as well. And there's social media of the kids as well, because those kids have Instagrams, those kids have TikToks and so on. And you can, you can use that as well. Um, and, and Nadia, I think, we are out of time, um, although I wish we could we could have heard from all of you um, much more. Um, but please do share in the chat any um, additional resources or information about the very important work you're all doing in any ways that uh, we can all help. Yes, uh, Jackie. Uh, I think I'll take this moment to uh, to talk about that. One of the outcomes we hope from this roundtable is to uh, build, like I said, a global coalition identifying activists and various organizations that are working on these issues. And we will be able to post uh, the organizations and what they do so that people can get to know each other. 
but not only organizations that are, are currently working in Ukraine, but of course people have been working on these issues of you know human trafficking all over the world. So we hope to bring them into the uh, the work so that we could also learn uh, best practices or things because as you have heard, so many challenges, including just even identifying uh, where these children are, who they are. So the idea of of even uh, having a a registry is, uh, you know, is is the, we just be, they're just beginning to you know to put these things together. So um, this is just the beginning um, of our you know collaborative work. Yes, it's very unfortunate that Mikala. Um, I guess we just have to remember there is a war going on. And even though sometimes we, because we're still able to communicate, it, we, we're not as conscious of it, you know, at the moment. But so he's having uh, connection uh, issues in connecting. Um, let me just say uh, he was in, uh, in Washington last week. So we had a chance to meet with him and talk a little bit. Uh, you know, of the officially right now, I think it's 20,000 uh, children that have been identified as being kidnapped. I think it's around 300 that have been recovered uh, around there. So it's such a small number. And Save Ukraine has been one of the uh, major organizations that has been conducting these rescue missions. And actually between the panels, we do have a, a couple of videos that uh, talks about their work. Um, so you'll get to, to uh, see a little bit more about information about their work. Um, I have to also, I'd like to uh, piggyback on what Sasha was talking about, um, you know, her traveling to, to Africa to uh, talk about some of these issues. You know, one of the things I think we, we need to remind everybody, uh, inclu including those very concerned about the children of Africa, that they are suffering too because of Putin's war in Ukraine. The world's food security has been threatened by Putin's war in Ukraine and because they're not able to ship. So it's this is a war that impacts all of us, no matter where we are. Um, so it's it's important to understand uh, the, the full, I say, consequences or scope of, of, this, uh, of this war that is ongoing and particularly how it is affecting uh, the most innocent of children. And I would say all over the world. Uh, Jackie, um, again, thank you very much. I don't know if anybody in the panel would like to say a few clo closing words. We have, I think, about two or three minutes. No, okay. So again, thank you all for participating. Uh, as I said, this is the beginning of our uh, getting to know each other and working together. So we will uh, move onward. And uh, thank you again very much. And again, uh, Jacqueline, thank you very much for your uh, moderating of this panel. And thanks to, to you all for, for sharing, um, again, your very important work. Thank you. So now we'll go to the videos. С первого класса меня все равно обзывали украинец там, не украинец. Это уже давно начиналось. И ущемляли, и во многом ущемляли. Они думали, что вот какая Россия молодец, кого-то там освобождает. А я лишь просто говорю, что мне жалко детей, которые гибнут. Да что подохли эти твари украинцы? Ты иногда срывался, потому что все-таки, как они называют тварями тех, это мои родные, это мои знакомые, это мои близкие. Я переехал и сразу же с вот этим прапором снял видео, чтобы 
русские увидели, что у меня все хорошо, что за меня может не беспокоиться, они сразу мне там уже пожелали смерти. Приятно, потому что я это хотел очень долго. Все отримать инструкции, мы завтра с вами встретимся, больше детально поспокоимся. випадки, коли вам не захочуть, припустимо, там, скажуть, що ні, залишайте вашу дитину, ми ще попікуємося, то ми скажемо вам, як діяти. Добре? Очень, очень тяжело, я вам скажу, мені наразі. Це другий раз вже в мене попитка, щоб забрати дитину. Просто накручувала себе, не знаю, вже не знаю, що думала. Thank you. Uh, the person that was featured on the video is uh, Mikola Kuleba, who heads up the organization uh, Save Ukraine. Uh, here we have a map that uh, actually I think came from the Yale report uh, about some of the camps where children are being held. And they themselves say that this is just, you want to say, the tip of the ice, uh, iceberg. And you will note, and, they, and the Yale report notes, that some of the camps on the far east east of the Russian Federation, they are 10 times closer to the U.S. border than they are to the Ukrainian border. So this is how widespread uh, this uh, program of abducting, kidnapping children uh, is uh, executed. Uh, and the number of people that ha that have to be involved in order to um, make to execute this horrific program. Uh, the map, which talks about the journey that family members have to make in order to rescue their children, they have to travel three thousand miles, uh, going first west to. Uh, the Western countries, um, then into Russia proper, and then trying to get into the Russian occupied um, territories of, of Ukraine to rescue. So the round trip uh, journey is 6,000 miles that um, these family members uh, undertake in order to rescue some of their family members. And Mikala has talked about uh, a grandmother who went to rescue two of her grandsons and was only able to bring one back home and the other uh, remains in, in prison to this day. So again, uh, we're sorry that Mikala was not able to join us, but uh, we've had him in a previous webinar and I'm sure that we will again 
uh, have him uh, to discuss um, some of the, the, these issues. So we look forward to that. Thank you. And so now we have a couple of minutes break uh, before we uh, go on to the next panel. <laughs>